We are two weeks away from training camp. And that means more preview content here on the Real Forno Show. And we are going to be talking about offensive tackles. We're splitting the offensive lineup into two groups. And next week, we'll be splitting the defensive line into two groups. And this preview content will end up going just into training camp. But we want to make sure we give each position group enough time to shine. And this offensive tackle group is arguably one of the best in the National Football League. Grab a seat. Grab a drink. Let's have some fun on The Real Forno Show. by Tyler Bornis, the managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire, writer for the College Football Network, publisher of Substack Run in Shooter, host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, as well as a founding member of Vikings First and Score. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the let's start over. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Real Forno Show. Already seeing Mary and Davey in the comments here. Thank you all for tuning in here. We are going to have some fun here tonight. I am your host, as always, Tyler Fornis with me in the top right corner. His name is producer Dave. Dave, I have to ask you a very serious question right now. What's that? What's in the glass? Woodford Reserve tonight. Do you like rye? I love rye very much. You so. should you should try their rye. Mo- better than most bourbons, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their rye is really good. They have a Kentucky Derby uh, specific. I, I can't remember if it's branding or if it's something specific to help make the mint julep better. Ooh, but I, um, I checked that out. Yeah, that Woodford is really good. I think we it was had- Dan, Dan Hinneman, who's on mm-hmm. with us as well right now who keep who kept badgering me to try the Woodford and Dan it is very good I like it so we're trying something new out with Odie today he is allowed to roam the main level and then come upstairs into the office instead of being cooped up so I apologize if you end up hearing a squeaker toy um, he's got one right now so trying to get me to play with him but I <laughs> am obviously busy and well, we're trying this because he peed on one of my shirts earlier today. Oh. <laughs> so we're trying that. Um, we're going to see how it goes. Um, and uh, we need to add friend of Odie to the intro. Um, I, I like that a lot. Odie I do is, too. I do too. We are actually looking at getting Odie a friend. And if things go right, we may have him a friend next week. Uh-huh. We'll We'll see how everything goes. Rescues are a little complicated. Um, we're going through like a rescue, not the Humane Society. Um, so things are a little different uh, as far as getting to that step. Because yeah, they, their process is different because they have a different process. So it's fine. But thank you, everybody, for coming in. Odie is... It, you might be able to hear him snort, actually, because he's trying to play with me as I'm talking. But thank you all. I see you in the comments, and I appreciate you coming in and joining us. Aaron, one thing, it isn't wanna, that bad. Yeah. Hopefully, you're staying I, cool there, buddy. I want to address one thing that's kind of off topic of um, the Minnesota Vikings because I feel like it's important, and I just I want to frame this properly if anything ends up happening in the realm of Minnesota Vikings. So you guys understand kind of where we're at and how things should be viewed. Um, If you haven't heard Pat Fitzgerald of Northwestern just got fired. He was a well-respected and revered man and coach for a long time. Um, He was the middle linebacker star middle linebacker of the, the Northwestern team that made the Rose bowl in 1994. It was, it came out a couple days ago, Northwestern student paper one, God bless student newspapers that have the guts to go after one of the most respected men in, in all of college football and the highest paid on campus to have that, that, that gusto to do what's right is nowhere near 
as commonplace and necessary in today's society as it should be. More people should have that and they don't. Those individuals, one, deserve a huge, huge chunk of credit and praise for all their reporting. What ended up happening was apparently there was a culture of hazing, a culture of, um, I, I don't know if it's the right word, but I'm going to use it, sexual assault. And they, they would basically punish young players for doing wrong things on the football field and calling it things like running when they would just do unspeakable things to degrade them, assault them. And apparently the coaching staff was in on it. And the whole reason why I bring this up is if you are a well-respected individual that gets caught doing something like that, and you are, it is reported that you knew about this and you participated in it. Just that you please didn't quash it. That yes, that's it's, it, well it, deserving of the firing. Yep, I'm, I'm, that's not even what I'm saying. If you if if something happens to that person, please don't go out and talk about how good of a person they are. If they're that good of a person, they wouldn't have done those things. When those things are reported, just remember two things: one, don't jump to defend them. Make sure you believe those who were were affected and also remember innocent until proven guilty it's okay to just not to not say anything but don't go defending somebody that you don't know and even if you know them be careful because you don't always know somebody this is eerily similar to the joe paternal stuff if you remember that no just be careful i, I wanted to just talk about it because it's it's been weighing heavy on my mind. Just, just be careful. Anytime a situation like this, if Justin Jefferson does something tomorrow, like just make sure that you're handling it from a place of understanding and respect for everybody. And don't just offend him because he's a Minnesota Viking. That's not how life works. And, then, and, and I, a good I, rule of thumb I, also is to wait a little while. See, all the news reports that come out don't rush to judgment because we know news reports can be false. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Now this has been corroborated. That's why yeah. he got fired, but yes. you don't do that. Hey, if we screwed up, we ran, but it wasn't like that. It was around mm -hmm. the football field and around mm -hmm. the football field and around the football field. And if everybody screwed up, we were running up and down suicides. You and know. that's that's a whole different thing, and you're 100 percent right. Mm -hmm. But I, I I just just remember two things, and it's something that um, they talk about a lot with uh, uh, those who are victims of sexual assault. Believe them, but also remember at the same time, and it's a very delicate balance. Innocent until proven guilty. Make sure you gather everything before you come to any judgment, but also believe somebody who's coming who is talking about how they were Im impacted. Sorry for the little rambling PSA. It's just been weighing on my mind, and I, I, I felt like I, I needed to say something. Raymond, you do hear Odie with the squeaker toy. But it he isn't is re bad. He's re ready for me. Yeah, they, Dave, that's because we got the good mics now. We're, <laughs> we're silent. Um, and we're going to talk about the Minnesota Vikings. Um, well, first, I want to acknowledge Davey Chains. He said, gather all the facts. Davey was a criminal detective. In the military, very good. At oh, it. he does well, know what he's talking about on that. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Davy. Yeah, um, sorry about the. I I just felt like I had to say something in general, and it's just been weighing on my mind because too many young individuals were were so negatively impacted, and there were way too many people who just jumped to the defense of Fitzgerald, who, based on all the information we have was a hundred percent complicit. It just gather the facts. Don't rush to judgment. Believe those impacted. Just remember that. Now let's talk about your Minnesota Vikings. This is a very interesting position group at offensive tackle. We've had offensive line issues for the better part of 10 years. 
We also arguably have a, one of the top offensive tackle groups in the entire national football league. We have a top five left tackle, a top five to 10 right tackle and two really good swing tackles in Blake Brandel and Oliudo. This is a very deep room and there's even so potential behind them. Vidarian Lowe has potential. They drafted him with the idea of a slow development and maybe taking over for Brandel or Udo in that swing tackle role. Like this is a very good group and looking at them from the perspective of like you have Darisa and you have O'Neal. Like let's separate them for a second. They're on a, a whole different level. When you look at the depth, it's good. Brandel it struggles a little bit rushing on the with rushing on the outside. So guys can come at him with speed. But what they can't do is like just go straight at him. He's going to be able to use his reach because he's six seven. Use his reach to keep them at bay and then prevent them from really being able to take that next step and get through him. They have to go around him with speed. Udo is more athletic. He still gets beat with speed. Because, and he's a bigger guy. He's like, th- I mean, you can look at him. He he is a very well put together individual. He's 6'6", 320. He can get bit, beat with speed too, but he's a lot quicker than you think he is. And he struggles a lot with counter moves. Like if I take a hard step to the outside shoulder. Okay. So right here, it looks like he's playing right guard. Okay. So if you see uh, um, his right shoulder, if I take a hard step towards that, and he opens his hips and you like spin move around him, he can get beat pretty easily because he can overset and all that momentum being such a large individual. He can't just flip his hips and be able to take that on. He can get beaten. And that is, um, that that's something to just be mindful of with these guys. That's why they're not starters, but it's, but they're very good players. Uh, Udo and he had a couple run-ins with the law in May. Reckless driving, speeding tickets. Lead foot. Yeah. Um, th- it doesn't sound like he was actually putting anybody in immediate danger, but something to be aware of because that could lead to a suspension on the personal conduct policy. Some, just keep it in the back of your mind. Let's talk about the top though. Derisaw is arguably a top five left tackle in football. Tremendous season last year. Second in overall PFF grade for an offensive lineman. Sorry, an offensive tackle behind only Trent Williams, whom Derisaw was get garnering comparisons last year too. I remember talking about it with you, Dave, and I thought it was a, a little absurd. I didn't think it was like, it wasn't a one-to-one. But then when you started seeing him, it's like, oh, these aren't absurd. I get where they're coming from now because he'd have those plays where he'd be in the open field. And it was like, I, like when you were a kid and you started playing T-ball and the coach was like a 16 or 17 year old, and you're five or six. It was like watching one of those coaches just go and pulverize a kid with a block that's standing on second base. It just, some of it just wasn't fair. And Derisaw was able to just level guys. And one thing that he got dinged for, and it was something that Brandon Thorne, who um, runs the Substack Trench Warfare, he is one of the smartest people in all of football media when it comes to offensive defensive line play. He talked about... Like, and if you like the big round bellies, I highly encourage you to subscribe to both his Substack and his uh, YouTube. Because he goes through uh, some wonderful stuff. And he brings guys on for film sessions to talk through stuff with them. And those are phenomenal. But he talked about how Darisa just pushes guys out wide too often and how that's a detriment because he's not really winning the rep. He's just not losing. Well, I'll counter with a couple things and I may not be phrasing it perfectly. So keep that in mind. One, you can do that with the guy like Kirk cousins because Kirk cousins drop back point is so consistent. So when he's dropping back, you, if it, if the ball's on the five yard line, you know, he's going to land on the 14 every single time, you know, because he's that consistent. Like one of the, we talked about him being so robotic. 
This is one area where being robotic really makes a difference because he's consistent. You know he's going to land at this point every single time. And Darison knows that. So, like, okay, just run around. Have fun. You're not going to get to him because you're going to run way too far, and I'm going to make sure of it. That That's not a bad thing. That's not a detriment. I understand you want to see him attack a little more, but he's winning the rep. He's making sure that his defender is not getting a sack. So I don't necessarily think that that analogy of his play is necessarily fair because he's using a drop point for cousins to his advantage in protecting his quarterback. I think that's really smart, but I haven't had a talk was, with Brandon about that specific piece. So I don't, maybe he's got a little more intricacies, but that's the gist of it. And I think was, that's important. It was one of the things taught to me that if you can deflect him off the, and as I put it on Sunday, the, their rushing trajectory, and you can divert it to where you're blowing your defender by the quarterback, you've basically taken him out of the play. And that's a win. Right, because sometimes you're not big enough or strong enough to handle that defender, mano a mano, if you're locking it up together. But if you can take his weight and his momentum and push it somewhere he doesn't want to go, and it may not be by far, right? He's coming up field, he's aiming for the quarterback. It doesn't take that much strength to deflect that just a little bit and get him off track. And like I said, if you take him out of the play, you've won the rep. Mm-hmm. And that's important. It's very important. You just Playing offensive line is not necessarily about winning. You love to win. You want to win. Dave, it's about not losing. Exactly. You don't have to win. You can tie. If you tie, that's a, that's a win because he's not getting to the quarterback. He's not getting to the running back when they get the ball in the, out of the backfield. Um, Dr. Proto, I'm going to talk about the Achilles. So hold, hold tight. Once we get to O'Neill, there's going to be, we're going to have quite a bit of discussion. It's about making sure that you're not allowing your defender, your responsibility to impact the play. If you're doing that, that's good enough. Now, do you want to absolutely annihilate? Yeah, it's way more fun. It's fun to just be able to bury somebody into the ground. It's fun to be able to just annihilate people because that football is a sport of aggression, but it's also a sport of being a tactician and being super technical. You can use your aggressiveness, your advantage in those situations by out leveraging a guy, by striking a guy perfectly. You look at Darisaw's hands. If he takes that hand and blasts a shoulder, well, guess what? You're getting that aggressiveness out, but you're not being evil. Like that's, I think where the difference is where people talk about aggressive in nature, a lot of people's minds, including my own for a long time, would go to Steve Atwater where mm-hmm. Atwater would literally use his body as a projectile missile and just attack you. That was the game in their mid nineties, right? That was how you played football. There was, there were shows that dedicated. I can't remember the name of it dedicated specifically to monster hits. Like in today's game, you can be aggressive and you can be violent without actually hurting people in in an extreme way. Look, anytime you block, you're going to hurt somebody like that. That's just football. You're going to get bumps and bruises. You're hurting people, but there's hurting people. And then there's hurting people. And that's, that's where the difference lies. Darisaw hurts people, but he doesn't have a malicious intent to injure. And I think that's where that aggressiveness kind of shifts. It was also something that he didn't show at Virginia tech, but my deductive reasoning says that he was never asked to do that. And he was asked to protect in a specific way to where he wasn't. He was not asked to finish. He was asked to kind of just stand still. And that's why we're seeing that finishing come out. Now, if you would have been a finisher in college, that dude's going top five. He didn't. There were questions about it. Jacked up. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. That was the show. Steve Atwater is a top five all-time favorite player for me. If I had to rank my top five favorite players, I'll, you know what? I'll do that at the end of the show. Cause I think that's a good hook. And I want to really think about it while we're continuing to talk offensive line. 
Steve Atwater's in my top five. And let me tell you, you guys already know the other one, at least one more in my top five, at, at least if you're watching YouTube right now. Darren Hall. Yes. <laughs> on Purple Daily on Draft today, uh, Declan asked me a really interesting question. If I was Batman in the Dark Knight, do I save Rachel or do I save Harley Dent? Rachel was Malik Willis and Harvey Dent was Jaron Hall. Mm-hmm. I can only pick one. Mike, I, I, I told him that it was workplace harassment and I need to talk to HR. Like, yes. I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to this bullying. And I'm like, Oh wait, Judd is probably HR director. That's not going to make a difference. <laughs> I, it, yeah. I got a, got a couple good laughs, but it, it's a, it's a good story. And where that came up from is that he might be available. Who? Uh, Malik Willis. If somebody offered oh, a small yeah. trade. Listen, I, I would, hey there, I would hey trade. There, Chris. Hi, Chris. I would trade a conditional pick for Malik Willis. I still believe in him. If you don't, that's fine. Like you, you can be against the deal. I respect that. But we won't talk about Malik Willis because we're talking about offensive linemen. I think Darisaw is going to be recognized widely as a top offensive tackle in football, and it's not going to take much for him to get there. The big thing here is Dave. You don't like it's hard sometimes to get the recognition you deserve for this kind of thing. We all saw it. Not everybody watches as much Vikings football as we do. Very few people watch it as critically as we do. He's going to get that recognition this year. And it's going to be a lot of us saying, uh, we tried to tell you we really did. But alas, now let's talk about Brian O'Neill. Dr. He's Proto brings up. And what's nice yeah. about it, he's only going into his third season. I know. He's got I way oh. a lot of time to uh, submit himself as one of the best tackles in Vikings history, if not the best. That's the trajectory he's on, folks. The absolute trajectory. Hey, I want to welcome everybody that didn't get uh, immediate shout out, Jeremy. Norse Fias, I don't know where you've been, buddy, but it's glad to see you back. It's cold for life. Zoe, I'm glad to have you here. And what's the deal? I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Bob Swede, William, the doc, of course, Justin Day, partner here on Vikings First and Skull. And let's see who else is here that we may have missed. Of course, we talked Raymond and Skull for Life. I'm scrolling through. Who else? Oh, the lovely and beautiful Miss Mary. Anthony Carton Cartagena. Ah, that's I'm sorry, buddy. I mispronounced that. He's got the, a purple Kong. That's and wonderful. You know what? Courtesy of Mary's care package. Woohoo. Yeah. Odie gets spoiled. It's uh, honestly crazy. Everybody loves him. And I mean, can you blame them? I don't. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's talk t- about Brian O'Neill. I'm about um, to say it's time to move the other side. Partially torn Achilles tendon. And it was brought up in the chat by Dr. Proto. He's concerned about it. And somebody else in the chat brought up the Score North uh, show. I did not get a chance to listen to it because I, I already kind of. Oh, yeah. But I, Dave, I'm busy. Okay. <laughs> Um, I told you there's a story there. uh, I've I've already written about the partially torn Achilles thing, so I didn't want to. But he got real specific into the type of tear, where it was located, how it is repaired, and the prognosis on full recovery. Nobody else has done that. That's what made that so amazing. uh, That because he was the word and i don't remember it off the top of my head intersectional or inner something or other if you guys are watching you can correct me on that but where it's torn is not further up on the achilles but down near the bone and all they had to do was just basically anchor it in the place with industrial staples or whatever the heck orthopedic surgeons use bump 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 and then it'll heal and there is basically 99 to 100% full recovery 
where there's no diminishing of his ability because of where it tore. He's, the doc said if it had torn up, which most of them do up here, they don't normally get back to 100%. Yeah. When At they least get repaired. Not- His was down here towards the heel, and they got to to anchor it well and stitch it, wrap it, do all the things that orthopedic surgeons are so good at now, and that he should be 100% eventually, once it's fully recovered and he gets over the mental portion of it, and good to go. It will not be a hinder. It's not going to be like Phil Lodo Holt. Yeah, and that that's a big thing, especially when it's partially torn, when you don't, like, it's not just the tear. The tear, absolutely. But when it's partially torn, that's a big deal, too, because mm-hmm. then you don't have to do a full reconstruction, and the rehab is a lot simpler. And when it comes to gaining that explosiveness back, and one of O'Neal's biggest traits is being athletic, getting out in front of guys, putting his foot in the ground, and powering forward to provide that leverage element. He can still do those things, and that's going to be a massive, massive benefit to the Minnesota Vikings in having a stalwart pair of tackles, as you can hear Odie with that squeaker toy. That Just to remember in the chat, if you hear the squeaker toy, it is Mary's fault. <laughs> Only Mary. It is Mary's fault. Blame Mary. Not mine, not mine for having it on the ground. It is Mary's fault. We love you, Mary. Uh, but O'Neal is a stalwart. He had one more pressure allowed than Christian Derrissaw this year on, I believe it was about a hundred more pass blocking snaps. We have two of the best tackles in the football and we have one of the best starting tackle duos. In well, the I think we have football. the best starting tackle duo. I don't think so. Um, Who, I would go team? Philly, Philly, Jordan, my lot on Johnson. Okay. I would so say we're number two. Uh, two is probably the spot you could argue the Packers with Bakhtiari. And if Elkton Jenkins is the, it ends up starting a tackle. Yeah, but Bakhtiari is always hurt. But Bakhtiari is arguably the best tackle in football when he's healthy. That's like, that's part of it. So they're a, a top three tackle duo, I think is fair to say. And th- you can exchange some things around and, but it's it's a great duo. And if O'Neal comes back and plays at 100%, mm-hmm. that's a huge deal. And I think his job is going to be easier. And you can r- go ahead and check it out on Vikings where I wrote about the offensive tackle group today. The big thing with O'Neal's last year, I think he compensated too much. He overcompensated too much to help Ed Ingram. I don't think he's going to have to do nearly as much this year. Um, <laughs> Odie is our starting tackles. The squeaker toy are the defensive ends. I love it. That is very clever, Jeremy. Thank you for that. Odie is. I was laughing yeah. at Justin putting Tyler, bus, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Mary under the bus. Okay, that's what that was. Okay. I, I, I couldn't really tell the emoji. It to On my side, it looks like a flag. It almost looks like the Ukrainian flag. Mm-mm. It's a bus. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I I know Mary knew I was just talking in jest, and she she the laughing faces that were assigned. So I'm glad. But not having to. Oh, um, yeah. Guards don't matter. But I'll explain that in a minute. The big thing with O'Neal having to kind of compensate and help out Ed Ingram not having to do that this year is going to be huge because then he can just handle his own business. And that that's a really good thing. Chris Thompson, old friend of mine, old roommate of mine brings up a good point about me believing guards don't matter. They don't. And mm-hmm. let me explain the mantra behind guards don't matter. It's the same behind running backs don't matter. All you need is average. You don't need to pay an elite one unless you have an ungodly great one like Quentin Nelson, mm-hmm. like Zach Martin, or you all of a sudden have a massive surplus of cap space and rookie quarterback, then then pay a guard. Yeah, like you can do those kinds of things. But having tackles and center is more important than having guards. And I will contend that guard is the least important pos- starting position on a football team of the tw- of the 22 on offense and defense. It 
left guard and right guard are the two least important positions. Like they're they're important, they're, but they're down there during the bottom. I'd have to look at you it need compared to tackles or defensive tackles or um, linebackers. Just don't be a liability. That's mm-hmm. all I want. Don't be a liability. You know what Ezra Cleveland is not a liability. I think nope. Ed Ingram is going to have a massive jump this year, and we're going to talk about that on Wednesday show. But let's talk more about the the backups behind him. We're going to start with Blake Brandle. Left tackle by trade. The initial thought was to move him inside to guard, but he's 6'7". Mm-hmm. This dude is a massive, massive man. When you have Brandle start in those couple games for Christian Darison when he's out with the concussion... One of the big things with Brandles, he loses to speed. He just doesn't have that foot quickness. What he does have is length and strength. If you come at him, he will swallow you up. If you run around him, he will struggle. So if you go back and watch the Patriots game, you'll notice they always had a running back chipping or a tight end chipping or making the edge rusher run around the tight end so Brandle could get in better position And the Patriots only got one sack and it wasn't even Brandle's fault. You can adjust for what Brandle is, but you don't want that guy starting for you 17 games a season. That's kind of what makes him such a good swing tackle where he can just be a guy to make a difference and help you out in a pinch. But he's not the guy. He's not the future of the team and he's on technically he only has two years vested because of how NFL contracts work. He was a sixth round pick in 2020. I remember it was either with you or Jason of climbing the pocket, Dave, where I I talked about Brandle with right after the draft. And I, I liked him, but you could just tell there were athletic limitations and there are, Mm -hmm. But he has the technique down. He's got good size. He's got good length. If you have to help him every now and then to make sure he doesn't get blown by, that's fine. I can live with that. And he's a he's a talented football player. And because he's uh, only got two vested years, he's making nine hundred and sixty five thousand this year, I believe. Next year he's going to make like one point one million. Pretty good for a cheap. swing tackle. Yeah. Yep. Same with Ole Udo. Now, Ole Udo has a very weird contract. So let's talk about that for a second. It surprised Ole. me that Ole Udo stayed to become a backup tackle. I expected him, as we've said in previous shows, to go off into free agency and try to find a starting job somewhere and make I don't, more money. I don't think anybody wanted to give him a starting job at tackle. And I think that's why he came back. So here's how his contract works there is a clause in the CBA that allows you to pay a guy and only pay him the minimum salary cap hit on the salary cap. So Oli Udo is collecting in cash about $2.5 million this year. His cap hit is 1.2. So in order to get that, you have to be like a, a day three guy or a UDFA guy who's played all four seasons with his, the team that drafted him. And then you can, get that kind of contract and it's a really nice deal. Rashad Hill had that contract a few years ago. You get, you don't have to take up much salary cap space. And quite frankly, that's huge. Oh, Odie, you found another squeaker toy. You're such a good boy. Yep. This one is not Mary's fault. This is my wife's fault. <laughs> Feel free to tell her. I, I I'll tell her, no, it's your fault. You you got him the birth the birthday cupcake. But they, they used that contract to bring him back. And it's great for Udo. It's great for the Vikings. They get a much better swing tackle because Brando's gonna play the left side and Udo's gonna play the right. But they can go play either side. So technically you have two swing guys, but they're kind of pigeonholed. Um the Vikings are gonna try to use them at their preferred spots because hey we can it's just smarter business to do so but udo has the ability to slide inside if absolutely needed 
but he's just so much more comfortable on the outside because he can kick step really well. He's got that athleticism and he's also big and physical when they drafted him in the sixth round out of Elon in 2019, the idea was for him to be a long-term project and maybe become a swing tackle or an eventual starter. Well, they, they they're getting a pretty dang good return from a six round pick. He's back for a fifth season. He's making good money and he's honestly playing good football. Uh, when he had to start in the playoff game for Brian O'Neill, Udo only allowed one pressure. He was a very, very solid aspect of that Minnesota Vikings offense. The, those are the kind of players that you need on your roster. And one of the reasons why this offensive tackle group is as good as it is. You need those stalwart guys because salary cap is preventing you from really building out true elite depth everywhere. So you need a guy like Udo to come in and just be a stalwart player. And that's a massive addition to this Vikings roster. I agree. I think we have good depth right now at both tackle spots, and we haven't had that in a long, long time. Yes, it's it's honestly great. But the players I'm really interested in seeing, Vidarian Lowe, six-round pick last year, only played a handful of snaps. I think it was like 33 against the Chicago Bears in Week 18. Played a total of five games, so he suited up five times. Lowe's a talented player but there are some athletic limitations. Luke Braun on his Patreon. It, you can find him on Twitter. Luke Braun NFL, a friend of the show, a friend of mine did a, a video about how he believes Vidarian Lowe can uh, make the roster. And I highly recommend you check it out when you're done here, because it, it does a really good job of breaking that down. I like Lowe. I think that he's going to make the team because, and this could change because we're going into year two. Quasi Dolph Mensa has shown a propensity to keep his guys over somebody else. Low, one of his guys selected. Hey, look, birthday cupcake. Yay. Bye, Odie. <laughs> uh, he was selected in the sixth round by Quasi, the first offensive lineman he selected. The only, oh, sorry, the first offensive tackle. The only offensive tackle he's selected so far in the draft. But it's hard to continuously take guys when you have the kind of depth the Vikings do. They may not take another offensive tackle for two years, depending on how things fall. Lowe has a really good chance of making the roster because of the depth. And they kept five guys at tackle last year. They kept 10 offensive linemen. Things can change year to year, but I would look for that to stay the same. And the two guys behind him, um, one of them is very familiar to Minnesota fans. Sam Schluter. You remember him from the university of Minnesota started at left tackle and right tackle on those really good Minnesota teams, the one that uh, won 11 games and nearly made the Big Ten title game, except they blew it against Wisconsin. Right, Odie? Did they blow it? Yeah, they did. Odie is just looking at me like, I don't care, Dad. Um, So, Schluter was the starting left tackle, and he was very good. He was an undrafted free agent, and the 49ers ended up uh, having him on their practice squad. And the Vikings signed him after uh, rookie mini camp. He was one of the few non rookies there and he got the call. This is the guy who's familiar with the Shanahan system. He's familiar with running a lot of inside zone, which is what uh, Kevin O'Connell really wanted to do last year. A lot of inside zone, a lot of duo, and he's familiar with that style. And I think this is a really good dart to throw on a guy who can play on both sides of the line. It's probably not going to go anywhere. But it's good to throw that kind of dart with somebody who had success and understands how you want to play football. Sometimes fit is more important than talent. That's not something that gets talked about nearly enough, Dave. You can be the most talented guy in the world. You go through a bad situation. Mm -hmm. like That's what Malik Willis is dealing with in Tennessee right now. A lot of talent, awful situation for him. Yes, Dr. Proto, Odie is in squeaky toy overload. Um, he is, he's just such a good boy. We've been on a couple walks today. He's just been a happy guy. And now I'm throwing the squeaker toy for him because it's just him and me in the house right now. But the other guy, Dave, Jackie Chen out of Pace University. I'll be honest. Nobody knows a lot about Chen. I'm fascinated to watch him. One of the reasons I'm so fascinated to watch him, Dave He's big. He's 6'4", 3'10", from a Division II school in New York, 
pace. What is this guy? Can this guy be developed into something? Is he just a flash in the pan? Is he just a ball of goods that you think could be good, but ends up just not working out? And yeah, but I like the idea of, Hey, this, there's this raw toolsy guy who was rumored of maybe being selected in the seventh round of the draft. Let's bring him in and see what we got. Maybe Chen is our long-term swing tackle. Could be. Hey, as long as you, uh, who was it? Jeremy was talking about if we don't have to draft an offensive tackle in the next two years, is that a pills or a champagne problem? It's, it's a good thing, but you always want to be developing somebody behind. And if that somebody is Chen and he turns out to be that guy this season, maybe he makes practice squad, but you're developing, develop and develop when somebody like Udo or Brandel go off somewhere else next year, he slides right in, and you have that. And then, God forbid, if O'Neal or Darisaw get hurt. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a very interesting dilemma that you're talking about here. It's not that you don't want to draft guys to be able to rotate in and be able to continue to develop, but when you have the Vikings currently have five guys that you could consider solid rosterable tackles. The Darian Lozen is going into his second year. Brando's going into his third vested year, which means he's got one more year of team control. Oli Udo's in his fifth year. And then you have your two starters for the long term. At what point, unless there's just incredible value, why are you taking an offensive tackle? You may want to, that's why you may want to wait until 2025 because of where your room is at. It's mm-hmm. it's a delicate balance, and that's why team building is so difficult. There right. is and a if not you have deal other two of these guys have career ending injuries next year, and then all of a sudden tackles a major need. Like that's mm-hmm. where you have to try and allocate your resources as smartly and intelligently as you can. It's a very difficult process. But right now, the offensive tackle is the least concerning need on the entire football team. That long snapper. Well, Andrew DePaul is 36. So if well, he yeah, eventually re- he needs replaced. Yes. Yeah. But they did sign him to a four year contract worth slightly above league minimum. And he was an all pro last year. So that's fine. Mm-hmm. Right, Odie? Yep. yep. It's it a good thing. Hey, I like the fact that we have a developing offensive line room. Tackles are obviously the anchors on the outsides. I think this is a mm-hmm. good thing. It's actually it it's a great thing since when you know Zimmer took over and then that line started to fall apart. Yeah, we haven't had that sort of stability in that that long, literally. Mm-hmm. It's uh this this group as as a whole, Dave, is very intriguing, and I'm excited to kind of see how how it plays out. Jeremy, I'm not trying to wish anything upon anybody that that's just a fact when it comes to football at any position, it cost the 49ers a shot at a super bowl because they had multiple quarterbacks get hurt. It just happens. It's there's no juju. It's just a fact. And my nose is itchy. I don't know why it's, it's fun being me sometimes. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, our, that's our show. The, this offensive tackle group is good. I'm really intrigued by the latter parts of the depth and how that will shape up, especially if they decide to keep a guy like Chen at, on the practice squad. I think that is very fascinating in itself. And we are looking at the strongest unit on the Minnesota Vikings, potentially one of the strongest offensive tackle units in the National Football League. And I don't say that lightly because our swing guys are two of the better swing guys in the league. Mm -hmm. And they're all young. We've got a young unit. Brian O'Neill's the oldest on the unit. I think he's 28. Yeah. Which means these guys are going to last because tackles will play into their young thirties. Yeah, absolutely. This is a very, very skilled group right here. And I I'm a fan. I'm a, I'm a really big fan of where this, this team is. 
and that that is our show um we're gonna have a lot more coming for you over the next few weeks highly recommend that you keep tabs and you keep tabs on everything we're doing at vikings wire because there's going to be written stuff including a written piece to pair with what we have going on here tonight for the state of the roster series and we're continuing to do player profiles. I've released multiple today. Ryan Wright, uh, Joan Williams, and Asesi Odomewo all today. Jalen Naylor's already written. That's coming in the morning. We have a lot of really good times. Um, I'm greatly appreciative of everybody who joined us here today. And as uh, I think it was Bob that said it, um, he's about to go have dinner. I'm about to go have dinner as well. But... Make sure you download our podcast feed and we're going to have some very intriguing stuff coming um, with Vikings first and skull and fan first sports network here soon that we can't wait to talk to you guys about along with that. Don't forget to check out Dave's episode of two all bloggers with Darren from yesterday. It is in the podcast feed and it is also on demand on our YouTube channel, especially then- when we talk about Ezra Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Hey, it, you know, what's funny. Uh, it, one of my favorite things about like game shows is like, will fortune will do like before and after. Mm-hmm. So it'd be like Ezra Cleveland rocks. And then it'd be like Cleveland rocks, the drew Carey show theme. That that's one of my favorite things. I love that kind of stuff. I, I'm just a dork, but this is, um, Dr. Proto. Um, Thank you, Dr. Pop, like, like comment subscribe all of those things help us grow grow here at vikings first and skull and we will have at some point before training camp i'm hoping to get one more vikings round table and i'm hoping to try and do that once a month to continue uh and we may change it up we may have some different voices on for the vikings expert round table to continue to have a more unique spin on what the Minnesota Vikings are doing and how it's being perceived by those who are covering the team. That's our show. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you Wednesday night at 6 PM here on the Vikings first and school YouTube channel. Dave, what do we say? We say skull Vikings, skull Vikings, baby. Like subscribe and ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community that we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!